I am going to try to explain Earl Sutherland's famous sets of experiments that um, kind of elucidated the identity of second messengers. I apologize in advance for any cats that decide to show up in this video. Uh, some of them really just like to be on video, I think. All right, so let's say that we have a cell here. Now, or you'll hear cats. So let's look at what they knew uh, before going into any of these experiments. What they knew is that you would have epinephrine applied to cells, and that epinephrine would cause certain effects. Um, in the case of the cells that Sutherland and his colleagues were studying, those were mostly liver cells. Okay, so what happened when epinephrine was applied to these cells? Well, what would happen is there would be production of glucose. And what Sutherland wanted to figure out was what were the steps that led between um, having epinephrine uh, applied to a cell and then having a glucose being produced? And then, yes, this glucose would be released from the cell. All right, so what he wanted to know is what's happening in between. Well, one of the things they figured out before these series of experiments that we looked at was that there was an enzyme involved. And that enzyme was glycogen phosphorylase. Remember, what does the ACE mean? It means it's an enzyme. So glycogen phosphorylase was responsible for catalyzing the reaction that produced glucose from glycogen. And glycogen is just a chain of glucose molecules. It is a starch, a complex carbohydrate, and that is a form in which your liver will store glucose. So this is glycogen. All right, great. We know how glucose is being produced, but we still don't know exactly how we get there from epinephrine. So they did some more experiments, and in those experiments, what they looked at was, okay, what parts of a cell do we need to make this happen? So let's say that they took a liver. They took that liver stuck it in a blender, and they made a homogenate. Basically, ground up liver. Liver juice, if you will. Now, that homogenate was blended cells. Um, and that's going to contain everything that was making up the cells, including, remember, cells have a membrane. And cells have all the stuff in the membrane, which is the cytoplasm. So what Sutherland really wanted to see was what part of the cell is necessary or what part of this homogenate might be necessary in order for epinephrine to do um, its work and cause glycogen phosphorylase to activate and then make glucose. So first thing he did was he tried out, okay, well, what happens when I put epinephrine with intact cells? Well, what happens is that produces glucose. All right, so that means glycogen phosphorylase will act on these cells and, I mean, that, and on the glycogen in these cells and make glucose. So epinephrine has everything it needs in these cells in order to activate that enzyme and create a cellular response. What about if we blend it all up? Would it still have the same activity? So he added epinephrine to the homogenate and the result was glucose. So he was able to see that, okay, a homogenate, even if all the components are not like arranged into cells, it's still enough for the, the epinephrine to lead to the activation of glycogen phosphorylase and that glycogen phosphorylase will make glucose. So he was like, okay, well, let's separate this into a couple of things. And he took that homogenate and he said, okay, what happens if I isolate out just the membranes? 
Now, when he had a test tube with just the membranes there, that did not have any activity of glycogen phosphorylate. So membranes only, no glucose. But then he added epinephrine, and what that did was actually not different. No glucose. Hmm. Okay. Sorry. Apparently the flash decided to go off. Oh well. Hopefully you guys can still see. Sorry. Um, so then he's like, okay, let's try the rest of this fraction. And we're going to look at the cytoplasm. What happens when I add cytoplasm only? Well, no glucose forms. Okay. What about when I add epinephrine? No glucose forms. Well, curses. So then he combined the two. And he's like, well, do I need both components? So we had another tube with membrane and with the cytoplasm. And then he added epinephrine and lo and behold, glucose was formed. So he concluded that you needed both components, both the membranes and the cytoplasm in order to have epinephrine have its action. Now, we're not gonna go through every single one of his experiments, just because like I was saying in class to some of you guys who I talked to, um, these experiments were done over the course of 20 years. So um, we don't have time to go over every single one, but let's just say that what he did discover is that there was an epinephrine receptor in the membrane. So some molecule was in the membrane that would respond when it was bound to epinephrine. So you apply epinephrine to a cell. That cell has membrane uh, receptors for epinephrine. When epinephrine binds to those receptors, that is going to trigger some activity downstream of that. And so the next step was, well, you know, something has to happen in the cytoplasm for glycogen phosphorylase to be activated. Because if you remember in our previous sets of experiments, we needed both membrane and we needed cytoplasm to have glycogen phosphorylase be activated. So the next question was, what happens here? Because he knew something had to happen from the epinephrine receptor. And the ultimate result of that was to activate glycogen phosphorylates. But what could we do? What um, cellular response was in place that would um, basically activate that glycogen phosphorylase? And, you know, this was before we had a lot of details about what molecules are found inside of cells. And so his first step was, let's try and figure out what type of molecule it is. So amongst the multiple experiments that he tried? Well, one was, he said, okay, what if we heated this solution? Are there any of the biomolecule types that cannot survive when heated? Well, proteins become denatured after heating. So the thought was, well, if proteins become denatured after heating, and I heat this cytoplasm solution, and then it's still capable of acting, activating glycogen phosphorylase, then there must be some non-protein mechanism to activate glycogen phosphorylase. He was trying to figure out what is this molecule. So what kind of experiment can you do? Well, you can take this cytoplasm portion And you can heat it. Something sometimes called the heat shock. And you can heat it so that you inactivate any and all proteins that are in it. Only problem is, once you have heated it and destroyed and denatured any of the proteins that are in it, 
That means that the glycogen phosphorylase that was in it was also inactivated because remember, it's an enzyme and enzymes are proteins, which means that in order to test the activity of this cytoplasm fraction to activate glycogen phosphorylase, you would need to add some inactive glycogen phosphorylase to this mixture. So if you could do that and then add epinephrine and still get glucose, then that would show that whatever this mystery substance is in the cytoplasm was not a protein. Turns out that it worked. Heating this cytoplasm fraction did not destroy its ability to activate glycogen phosphorylase. So, you know, you can say, okay, well, we have proteins, we have carbohydrates, we have nucleic acids, and we have lipids. It's not proteins because proteins would have been denatured and inactivated by heating. Um, not likely to be lipids because lipids would not be able to travel well on the inside of a cell. They're hydrophobic and the inside of a cell is an aqueous or watery solution. Ultimately, after a lot of work and remember 20 years worth of experiments takes a while, eventually they narrowed it down to this molecule called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is a modified nucleotide. If you remember, we've looked at um, its kin before. And I know this is not the most accurate drawing, but you will forgive me for that, I hope. Remember, this is ATP. When you take off one of the phosphates that are at the end, it then becomes ADP. It goes from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, all right? Then if you take off another one of these phosphates, it will change to a MP, adenosine monophosphate. When that happens, you can do uh, another chemical modification and then you can make it kind of circular. That is cyclic or circular AMP. So cir cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And it turns out that he had good reason to believe that this cyclic AMP had a role in this signaling pathway that would allow epinephrine to activate glycogen phosphorylase. Okay, so how do we test that? Well, what he basically decided is, okay, if cyclic AMP is an important second messenger in this pathway, epinephrine being the first messenger, then it should be able to replace that first messenger. So what he was saying is, let's do an experiment where we replace, cyclic a we replace epinephrine and its receptors with cyclic AMP. What that means is we should be able to take a cytoplasm mixture and instead of heat shocking it, and we're not going to need any inactive glycogen phosphorylase. So now we have another treatment. This treatment has cytoplasm in it. It has no membrane component because remember, we're trying to prove that the receptor is not necessary if you have cyclic AMP. And so we took that cytoplasm only fraction and he added to it cyclic AMP. And when he did that, turned out it actually produced glucose. So what he was able to show with that is cyclic AMP was able to take the place of that first messenger of um, that first messenger of epinephrine and could lead to the same effects as adding epinephrine. So he was able to conclude that somewhere along the way, an epinephrine receptor causes the creation of cyclic AMP and that cyclic AMP then leads to the uh, activation of glycogen phosphorylase. In reality, 
there are many more steps to this pathway. It's more complicated than that, but this was an important key step in figuring out these pathways. Uh, another important thing is to, to note that I, I know this looks complicated and you may think to yourself, well, why do we need to know why all of these, how all of these individual molecules are interacting with these other individual molecules? What importance is this? Well, if you've got somebody who's got a disease where they don't react properly to epinephrine, or what's gonna become probably a little more relevant to us is when we talk about insulin. If you've got somebody whose body doesn't respond to insulin properly, you need to know what's going on inside their cells so you can try and figure out what is going wrong and what you can treat medically. So it's important for us to know these individual pathways. That way we're able to intervene medically and we're able to understand exactly how things work inside of our cells. And a lot of these pathways are very highly conserved. Um, a lot of animals will have similar pathways to respond to epinephrine. And while uh, some of the um, first messengers or signaling molecules and receptors may differ, plants will at least have some similar signaling pathways happening inside of them. I hope that was a little helpful in understanding those experiments and will help you kind of understand a little more about uh, how we figured out these second messengers. Um, we'll try and tie back into this in another video talking about experimental design.